left. It was just eye-opening and it was so inspiring. And I mean, I was reminded of that scene in Land of and Freedom. I don't know if people have seen the Ken Loach film about the Spanish Civil War and there all these ordinary folk sitting around debating collectivization. And it was that sort of sense. It was ordinary people sitting around, or not just sitting around doing as well, but discussing and working out revolutionary politics and revolutionary change and doing it themselves from the bottom up. And it was really describing the beginnings of a grassroots democracy in Rojava. So, um, this is the autonomous Kurdish bit of northern Syria, is what we're talking about. And it didn't all just come out of nothing. It came out of ideas and ideas that came from Abdullah Oshalan, the imprisoned PKK leader in, from Tur imprisoned in Turkey. And a lot of those ideas he developed from ideas of Murray Bookchin. And I thought, oh, well, let's, you know, I wonder who's, who's writing about Murray Bookchin in, you know, the people in Scotland doing stuff about Murray Bookchin. So you Google Murray Bookchin Scotland. Oh, my goodness, he's around the corner and I know him. So <laughs> there's Mike Small. So just, I was just going to say just a very few words about the relationship to what's happening in the Kurdish areas and then I'll hand over for the serious bit to Mike. So... Just, as I said, the ideas came to the Kurds through Oshalan. Oshalan actually started as a Marxist-Leninist revolutionary. He was leading a guerrilla struggle for Kurdish independence. Uh, but already before his capture and imprisonment in 1999, he was moving away from a sort of nationalist approach. And when he was in prison, he read a lot more, he developed his ideas a lot more. And that's when he became very enamoured with the ideas of Bookchin. They never met, but they did correspond with each other. Um, so, since that film that I watched in 2014, I mean, there's been a lot happening. They've beaten back ISIS. The area that is controlled by the people in Rojava has grown, and they've actually changed the name, because Rojava means West, and specifically in this case, West Kurdistan. But it's not just Kurdistani, so they now like to talk about the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria. And that very much is an indication of the fact that it's a multi-ethnic, it's a multi-ethnic entity, and they're not claiming to be a state. And I just learned yesterday that in the in, on the 22nd of September, they had ele elections for local communes over that area, over that Democratic Federation, for 3,700 local communes in villages and neighbourhoods. And each of those will have co-chairs, one man and one woman as co-chairs, and very deliberately encourage representatives from different ethnic groups. And they achieved that with a 70% turnout. And you know, these are in areas that are not used to proper democracy, some of them, and areas that have just been recaptured. So it's all pretty impressive. Of course, they were able to set up this alternative system because of the vacuum created by the war. They want it to be seen as a model for the whole of Syria, as a possible solution for the whole of Syria. But it's a very precarious. I mean, obviously, it's in the middle of Syria, and there's that old Kurdish phrase that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains. You know, they've got allies, they've got people who are strategically allied with them. But apart from perhaps, you know, little groups like in this room and other similar groups across the world, really, you know, up in the high places of power, they don't have friends. They're not even being given a seat at the table in the discussions in Geneva. Um, they're pretty much under siege, it's difficult for things to go in and out of the area. They're reliant on, or despite the wish for an ecological system, they're reliant on very dirty oil. Um, so, and, and, it's, and it's difficult to do, you know, even to do the, the, the democracy. Not everywhere has the same interest. 
and there's always the possible conflict with higher structures. So it's very much a work in progress, but it's very, very exciting, and I think there's a lot we can learn from it. And I shall now hand you over to the expert, <laughs> Mike Small. Well, for those of you who, who don't know Mike Small, who's the editor of Bella Caledonia, and if you've not read it, you should. Thanks very much, Sarah, uh, and um, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be here, and um, we, we live in times of uh, unprecedented political and economic and ecological crisis. So ideas from elsewhere, from unexpected places, are essential, and I think that's what we're exploring tonight. Um, I must say I don't know very much about Rojava or the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, so that's not what I'm going to talk about, um, but there may be some people in the room who know more about that. Um, you may know me or you may not know me as either uh, the founder of the Fife Diet Project or from Bella Caledonia and think, well, why is he talking about social ecology? Um, but this is about democracy and ecology and the crisis of our times, and these things are intimately connected. So I wanted to try and do uh, three things. I wanted to try and explain a bit about uh, Murray Bookchin's social ecology, uh, why this has re-emerged in Syria, uh, a most unexpected phenomena. Uh, I wanted to put it in the context of how I know about this, and I wanted to open up for discussion what it might mean for us in Dundee, in Scotland, in Europe. Um, and I'm going to speak for a bit, and then hopefully we can have a, a conversation about these, uh, what I think are vital ideas. Um, I encountered Murray Bookchin's social ecology in 1994 when I was studying at Birkbeck College in London, and I was transfixed, transformed by them. As a young socialist or communist, I had been involved with the anti-apartheid movement, the Irish Republican movement, and the miners' strike. But the idea of always being against something, the idea of struggle, and the idea of waiting for a single moment, the revolution, was a debilitating and draining way to exist. By the 1990s, it was becoming more and more clear that the challenge we faced wasn't just about social justice and the inequality of capitalism, but that the economic system was destroying the planet. So the game was shifting. Bhopal, in 1984, stood out as an example of a global systems failure, which began to join the dots for many people. Union Carbide was making pesticides for sale to the West when 500,000 people were exposed to methyl isocyanate. The catastrophic nuclear accident at Chernobyl in 1986 also stood out as a reminder that the idea of an alternative to capitalism, this idea that we had twin uh, economic systems running concurrently, didn't really stand up. And as the, the Cold War unfolded, it became clear that there would be no peace dividend. And what we witnessed instead was the Cold War and the threat of mutually assured destruction gliding easily into the threat of global warming and the climate crisis. There wasn't a pause. There wasn't a moment where you thought, right, that's the Cold War over. Now we have a peace dividend. We just merged quickly into the climate crisis. And simultaneously, capitalism seemed to morph and accelerate. The commodification of an entire society seemed to beckon as technology and privatisation came together under the neoliberalism of Thatcher, uh, Major and Blair, and a new hyper-capitalism culture emerged. So I was a student in London, and I was transformed by a lecture by Murray Bookchin. And I went to study uh, to do a master's at the Institute for Social Ecology in Vermont for two years studying with Bookchin, uh, basically in his living room with a group of international students. I wrote my thesis on the idea of zoon politicon, democracy, ecology, and selfhood. And zoon politicon is the 
Aristotelian idea of political man. And I argued that we make sense of the world only if we're allowed to have a meaningful say in its running. If we're only consumers, we become commodified and alienated souls. This becomes circular. We are disaffected from political engagement because we are suffocated by consumerism, a consumerism that is driving the endless growth that is destroying the planet. We are therefore culpable in our own destruction, and the only solution is to regain consciousness through citizenship. So I just wanted to lay something out about Murray Bookchin, whose ideas you may or may not be familiar with, but are central to what's been happening in northern Syria. And this is, uh, to say the least, quite a bizarre set of circumstances have changed, because Bookchin's ideas in social ecology, while they were really important in the 70s and 80s and 90s, disappeared off the political map. Um, so... He died in 2006, and I wrote his obituary, uh, some of which I'll, I'll talk from. Uh, he was a theorist of the anti-globalization movement before its time, an ecological visionary, an advocate of direction, direct action, and a polem polemicist. Capitalism is a social cancer, he argued. It is the disease of society. The author of more than 20 books, Bookchin published his article The Problem of Chemicals and Food in 1952 under the pseudonym Lewis Herber. In America, in the 40s and 50s, there was such an anti-communist uh, agenda that you had to write under, under a false name. Uh, a decade later, again as Herber, he wrote Our Synthetic Environment. He called for a decentralised society, alternative energy, and wrote prophetically about pesticides, cancer, and obesity. The book preceded Rachel Carson's Silent Spring by nearly six months. So Rachel Car Carson's Silent Spring is the book about um, the effect of pesticides on birds, and it means that there will be a silent spring. Bird song will die out as a result of pesticides. And what she wrote has been proven true. The effect on pesticides on, on birds has been phenomenal songbirds. She wrote it in a much more lyrical way and she's often heard up as the sort of starting point of the modern environmental movement. The point I'm making is that he wrote the same thing uh, before she did. Um, his writing in 1964 anticipated the greenhouse effect and his magnum opus was The Ecology of Freedom in 1982 in which he wrote the domination of nature by man stems from the very real domination of human by human. He wrote, The long-term solution to the ecological crisis is a fundamental shift in how we organise society. A new politics based on face-to-face -face democracy, neighbourhood assemblies and the dissolution of hierarchy. For Bookchin, there was a clear distinction between ecology, which wanted to transform society, and environmentalism, which wants to ameliorate the worst aspects of capitalist economy. In Remaking Society, in 1990, he wrote, to speak of limits to growth under a capitalist market economy is as meaningless as to speak of limits of warfare under, war, under a warrior society. The moral pieties that are voiced today by many well-meaning environmentalists are as naive as the moral pieties of multinationals are manipulative. Capitalism can no, can no more be persuaded to limit growth than a human being can be persuaded to stop breathing. So the entire edifice of environmentalism has been predicated on this idea that we will somehow prevent capitalism's growth. And the point he was making now that is abundantly clear today is that that is a ridiculous political project that is doomed to failure. Bookchin was born in the Bronx to immigrant parents from southern Russia. His former, father, his, his former farmer father, Nathan, worked as a hatter and his mother was a member of the syndicalist union, the Industrial Workers of the World, or Wobblies. As a nine-year-old, he joined the Communist Young Pioneers, and in 1934, he was in the Young Communist League, which he quit, rejoined at the time of the Spanish Civil War, and then left again. After a high school education, he went to work in a foundry. 
Later, he was briefly a Trotskyist. After wartime <coughs> army service guarding the gold in Fort Knox, you can't really make some of this up, he worked at General Motors until 1950, during which time he took part in the 1946 GM strike. By the uh, 1950s, Bookchin had moved from Marxism towards a libertarian socialism. He had also been writing for Contemporary Issues magazine, which argued for a completely participatory democracy and identified Western capitalism and Stalinist East as a business partnership. In that decade, too, he was a co-founder of the Libertarian League. So we begin to see his transition, his political transition, and this is important as we understand what's going on here. By the late 1960s, Bookchin, based in Hoboken, New Jersey, was teaching at New York's Free University. In 1969, at a time when Students for a Democratic Society which had been a key force in the American left in the 1960s, was tearing itself apart, he published Listen Marxist, arguing for a post-scarcity anarchism. And as we kind of remember the 1960s, or as the 1960s is replayed to us as through the Beatles or counterculture, it's important to remember the radical politics that were happening at that time and, and recall <coughs> some of that. He said... The problem is not to abandon Marxism or to annul it, but to transcend it dialectically. Just as Marx transcended Hegelian philosophy, Ricardian economics and Blanquist tactics and modes of organisation, we shall argue that in a more advanced stage of capitalism than Marx dealt with, and in a more advanced stage of technological development that Marx could not have anticipated, a new critique is necessary, which in turn yields new modes of struggle, of organisation, of propaganda and of lifestyle. Without Bookchin's post-scarcity anarchism of 1971, anarchism would not be the force within the anti-capitalism movement that it is today. Bookchin parted company with anarchism in 1998, refocusing on communalism. But his writing lifted and sustained that movement from the 19th into the 21st century. And if we think about anarchism, we think, well, this is, this is kind of guys with masks doing in... McDonald's doorways or something like that on a demo or the black lock or something like that. But the kind of anarchist ideals have really been central to the left in the last 30 years. If you think about the Occupy movement, that is anarchist to its core and has been transformational for the left and for anti-capitalist movements. Employed at the Ramapo State College in Mawa, New Jersey in 1971, he co-founded the Institute for Social Ecology in Plainfield, Vermont, which won an international reputation for its courses in social theory, eco-philosophy and alternative te technologies. He taught there until 2004. In, to in retirement, he settled in Vermont, where in the 1970s he was ac active in the Clamshell Alliance, an anti-nuclear group which pioneered tactics of non-violent direct action. The list of movements and individuals Bookchin battled against is endless, but to dwell on his quarrels is to paint a picture of him as a sort of enragé. And he was quite a mad guy. He was quite a difficult person. He came from that culture, his background that I've described a bit, um, uh, meant that he was engaged constantly in battles and struggles, and some of that uh, did against him. But he was more reflective than his public persona suggested and was deeply influenced by Aristotle, Hegel, from whom he developed his idea of dialectical naturalism, Hans Jonas, Lewis Mumford, Theodore Adorno, and the anthropologist Paul Radin. So what does any of this mean, and what use can it be to us today. Bookchin's social ecology disappeared off the map before his death, sidelined by his very own egotistical rage and by being elbowed out by some of the very lifestyleism that he de deplored. Deep ecology, uh, which, which he challenged, and liberal environmentalism, which he critiqued, became dominant. Your hemp save the rainforest tote bag attests to that. The idea is best expressed by uh, a notion he raised uh, once where it was, we opened the, the newspaper and the, this idea of a green prison had been uh, launched. People said, oh, this is great, we've got a green prison. 
in which the electrified fence could be powered by solar panels. And you sort of begin to enter the ridiculousness of some of the environmental dialogue that he was engaging with. How do you move beyond that kind of paralysing nonsense? So here's two or three ways that this can maybe be useful. First of all, as techno fixes become dominant, it's useful to remember that the drive for domination is so deeply embedded in our systems and can't be fixed so easily. Bookchin and the wider social ecology movement asked us to think beyond our current paradigms. If we do not do the impossible, we shall, we shall be faced with the unthinkable, he said. And the assumption that what currently exists must necessarily exist is the acid that corrodes all visionary thinking. Further, he argued that an anarchist society, far from being a remote ideal, has become the precondition for the practice of, economic, of ecological principles. So his thinking is useful for us to raise the bar raise our thinking beyond what we are immersed in. Our media is so uh, immersive and corrosive that we begin to talk in the terms that they frame them. And it's essential that we get some key principles and begin to think beyond that. Secondly, I think his vision of a decentralised economy and politics is now essential to an alter-globalist movement. Bioregionalism, which he at first promoted and then later raged against, is, I think, a good place to start. How do we reconcile the units of political entity through geography and through place? How do we understand where we are? How do we move beyond states and begin to understand what is the best medium to organise our own selves, our own politics? And crucially, how do we reclaim the city, not as a spectacle for commerce, but as a place we own and re-inhabit? How do we become citizens is the key question he's asking. His idea is called libertarian municipalism. It's not very catchy, but that's what it's called. Libertarian municipalism is a political programme developed by Bookchin to create democratic citizens' assemblies in towns and urban neighbourhoods. The assemblies in these free municipalities join together to replace the state with a directly democratic confederation. And that's what we're actually seeing on the ground in northern Syria. Bookchin became an advocate of face-to-face -face or assembly democracy in the 1950s, inspired by writings on the ancient Athenian polis by various writers. For the concept of confederation, he was influenced by the 19th century anarchist thinkers such as Alicia Reclus and Peter Kropotkin. Bookchin tied libertarian municipalism to a utopian vision for decentralising cities into small, human-scaled eco-communities and to a concept of urban revolution. Libertarian municipalism uses the strategy of dual power to create a situation in which two powers the municipal confederations and the nation state coexist and are in tension. So there's a, a, a reading list and references for all of this that I can give to people uh, afterwards if anyone's interested in more. But his book, The Rise of Urbanisation and the Decline of Citizenship from 1986, is an overview of the conflict between the city and the nation state. He writes in 1991... <coughs> The struggle toward creating new civic institutions out of old ones or replacing the old ones altogether and creating civic confederations is a self-formative one, a creative dynamic formed from the tension of social conflict. The effort to work along these lines is as much a part of the end as the process of maturing from the child to the adult, from the relatively undifferentiated to the fully differentiated with all its difficulties. The very fight for a municipal confederation for municipal control of property and for the actual achievement of worldwide municipal confederation is directed towards achieving a new ethos of citizenship and community. Libertarian municipalism is an effort to transform and democratise city governments 
to root them in popular assemblies, to knit them together along confederal lines, to appropriate a regional economy along confederal and municipal lines. Third, he argued that we should look to our own radical traditions. So he's not trying to impose some American blueprint. It's important. He's offering guiding principles and philosophies, not a single ideology for our, us to download. So when I left him in 1995 or six, uh, I, my question to him was, well, what should we do? What should I do? And he said, you need to look to your own radical traditions in your own culture, in your own society, in your own politics. And I think in Scotland we have some uh, traditions that we can draw on to do that. Much of this, I know, sounds wildly utopian and absurd and sort of nonsense. You know, we're, we're dealing with Brexit, we're dealing with austerity, we're dealing with uh, uh, poverty and crisis. But I think his point is that if you only firefight, if you only struggle with the day-to-day, -day, you end up debating with people about whether the fourth road bridge is closed or not. You know, you end up being dragged down into the petty everyday here and now. And what we need to do is be able to stand back and reflect and go, what is going on here? What is going on here? And I think what's going on is we have a crisis of the political elite. It's more astute than I can ever remember. The people governing us are incapable and do not know what to do. And they are dragging us to economic catastrophe. The ecological crisis is absurd. Nothing is changing. The trajectory of the capitalist economy is marching on and we are appearing as if nothing really matters. So I think it's really important that we stand back and we look to other people and we get some bigger picture stuff because otherwise we get dragged into the nonsense. I think also that with new technologies and with the overriding failures of global systems, this kind of thinking becomes necessary, even essential. I wanted to read uh, one quote from a book he wrote called The Philosophy of Social Ecology, which tries to link some of his thinking about what's happening to the environment and what's happening to us, our psyche, our consciousness, our political outlook. He wrote, The terrible tragedy of the present social era, era is not only that it is polluting the environment, it is also simplifying natural eco-communities, social relationships, and even the human psyche. The pulverisation of the natural world is being accompanied by the pulverisation of the social and psychological worlds. In this sense, the conversion of soil into sand in agriculture can be said, in a metaphorical sense, to apply to society and the human spirit. The greatest danger we face, apart from nuclear immolation, is the homogenization of the world by a market society and its objectification of all human relationships and experiences into commodities. Not very Christmassy, I know, but it does ring true uh, 20 or 30 years down the line. So, how do we move this forward? How does this apply to the here and now? We know a little about relocalizing food systems and with solar tech crashing in price and solutions to storage issues being resolved, the possibility of a radically decentralized energy system may be very near. The idea a few years ago that you could have a decentralized, autonomous, democratic cities or regions kind of unreal for some key reasons. One which was the food system was great, even if it was killing us, and the energy system required a national grid. Both of those things are no longer true. Okay? It is very much within reason that we can have decentralised food systems, 
that would be affordable, sustainable and healthy. And it is very much true that we could have decentralised energy systems that people could afford and that would not be uh, privatised. And the experiments in Rojava are an extraordinary live experiment with these political ideas. We have here in Scotland some of our own traditions to draw on and can learn a lot from social ecology as we try and organise against disaster capitalism, climate crisis and globalism. Collapsonomics needs a response and that response, I believe, is social ecology. Thank you very much. I hope we can have some discussion about these ideas and thanks very much for inviting me to speak tonight. So, yeah. I think Book Chin. It's <laughs> a, a Russian name, I think. Um, was, was he born in America or did he migrate? Uh, I think he was born there, yeah. I think his parents were Russian. Right. Um, as this meeting is meant to be jointly about Book Chin mm -hmm. and Rajapa, mm -hmm. uh, I think we should avoid maybe being drawn into too many things to do with Scotland mm -hmm. or. To make as, as many comparisons yeah. to Rajava as possible. Yeah. Now, one of the advantages of living ne in or near Edinburgh is that the Scottish Parliament is in Edinburgh. And I went just a couple of months and, and lots of other events and groups hold discussions and meetings. So, a couple of months ago, I went to a meeting organised by the Scottish Solidarity with Kurdistan campaign. And of course, put my, I put myself on their emailing list. Um, so, although I had first of all found out about this a couple of weeks ago, I then got an email last week from SSG <laughs> um, about tonight and also about last night when there was a meeting of the, the cross parliamentary group on Kurdistan. Uh, held between 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock yesterday evening in the Scottish Parliament. So I went along to that. Sarah was at it. Um, there were eight people there. One of them was one of the MSPs who was chairing it. So I, what I learned from that is that... Um, now, I had previously learned that the group was formed about three years ago, the SS, when Stephen Smell started up. So, um, Anyway, the, last night was the third meeting of the cross -parly, parliamentary group. And Can you speed up a little bit? Okay. Most, mostly last night was taken up with um, a, a video link, a Skype link, to um, a man um, called Alan. Don't know his second name. Selman, is that how you pronounce it? The, the um, PYD representative in London said the PYD in the main political group. So we had an opportunity to actually question him about how yeah. these things were working in action. Okay. Uh, yes, and the, we had this for about an hour and a half. So it was a lot of, lot of. Uh, he answered a lot of questions. So what you've been talking about tonight, um, you know, it's very, it's very, it's very, very coincidental. The two were consecutive mm -hmm. evenings, and so I'm able to see, uh, understand more what you're talking about yeah. than what I heard last night. Um, so I think they, from you know, some details you can remember from last night, I think that formerly Rojava, now the, what was the Democratic, what's the, what are they calling it now? Democratic That's Republic? Right. Of, no. yes, Federation of Northern Syria. Syria. Oh, and they're yeah. divided into six cantons? Yeah, I think, I think we need, let's, let's, let's look a bit more at the ideas, because otherwise we can get... Did you, have a, did you have a question or a point that you were... Um, well, the, you know, the, the last, what I was hearing about last night uh -huh. was just was what you've been saying yeah. um, in, in terms of Bookchin's theory. Yeah, yeah. 
and in terms of what you've been saying about northern Syria, yeah. um, about out of the, coming out of the chaotic situation, yeah. they're trying to construct something very new, yeah. something I found very inspiring, right. um, putting us in most Western countries to shame sure. with the enlightened ideas that they're trying to implement. Sure. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could maybe uh, you know, expand on that a wee bit because I was also aware watching a video of him that uh, he was uh, um, taking up the whole, the whole issue and getting it from yeah. as well. And also uh, a fairly specific uh, question, I don't know whether you're going to answer it, but um, it's supplying the solution of municipal libertarianism in yeah. the situation of modern Dundee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, I'll try and answer those. Um, I think in terms of um, Bookchin's um, argument with lifestyle environmentalism and with deep ecology, he essentially argues that this is kind of bourgeois politics, that um, he was kind of really enraged by the kind of huggetry deep ecology movement, which he said uh, basically put uh, humans as the problem in the environmental crisis. And he said, humans aren't the problem, capitalism is the problem. There is no sense of solidarity in deep ecology. Uh, you cannot equate uh, the CEO of Union Carbide with a, a worker at that plant. They're both humans, one is powerless, one is powerful. This is a nonsense. And I think that he was largely right in that analysis. Deep ecology has been hugely important in terms of getting us a consciousness about the, the world, the planetary crisis, but it's absolutely hopeless about analysing power relations and um, has no sense of solidarity. And so he, some of his most important work is making that argument, and I think that's very valuable, if nothing else. On the question about contemporary Dundee and how does uh, libertarian municipalism apply to Scottish cities. There has been some work done by a Canadian uh, group on what they call Paracon, which is participatory economics, which tries to address this stuff. How would you organise as a city? The first thing you'd have to do is have, a, have charge of your budget. And a lot of local authorities and cities with, within Scotland don't have charge of their budget. They are they, they have some of it no, so that is the issue how do you take charge of your budget so you can make use of your own affairs and I think some of this stuff about participation is, is totally abused uh, in, in Leith where I'm from uh, in Edinburgh they have uh, you know pronounced right we, we want, want your say, we're going to make these swinging cuts what should we cut and then they ask and it's dressed up as being incredibly democratic, it's like well hang on a minute I don't want these cuts to happen so I think we are many steps away from this being viable. I don't doubt that for a minute. I'm not saying we should do this tomorrow. I think we're many steps away from it. But you do have a notion of cities becoming viable enti entities throughout the world. And for the first time ever, more people live in cities than in rural places in the, in the world today. So uh, if you think of London as twice the population of Scotland, um, Cities are viable units for organising our society and organising democratically. 
And Bookchin argues that you would organise that by what the Paris Commune called arrondissement, neighbourhoods, neighbourhood assemblies. So it wouldn't just be citywide, you would organise how your neighbourhood worked. And, you know, you can see some of this in, in Amsterdam, in Copenhagen. Uh, the city budget is then devolved down to an assembly, a, a neighbourhood, and they say, well, you run your child provision. Here's your budget for your area. And it has some pretty amazing results. Incredibly innovative, responsible, thoughtful uh, childcare facilities, for example, spring up. Um, uh, <clears throat> traffic management, organisation of the street, organisation of licensing becomes much more nuanced because that, the people of that neighbourhood organise it. So it does have tangible real life experiences, but you have to have the city being in charge of its budget and then you need to take charge of that city and beyond sort of tribal party lines and say, how are we going to do this in a way that is ecological and democratic? So there's a lot of conflicts and issues there. I don't know if that... Well, I mean, it just seems to me that... Uh, I mean, what's the... Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I cannot see where this campaign is actually going to lead. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think that's very true, and I'm not coming with all the answers. I'm talking about these ideas and the, the real on the ground issues of here and now. There's big steps to get to where we can actually connect those things. Can I, uh, can I say that uh, I sat in this very room a few weeks ago and listened to Leslie Rick talking about Scandinavia mm-hmm. and uh, the, the way that they have some of their local democracy yeah. broken down to much, much smaller groupings than we have. Yeah. And how perhaps uh, what we would consider a county ward, council ward, would have a budget yeah. that would be realistic to actually get changes in that area. Mm-hmm. And that uh, she knew people who had surprised her by saying that they were standing for election to these local groupings when she knew <coughs> that these people were political. Is it fair to say Absolutely, and I, but I think the, the point is it's not just our political setup. So Leslie talks very uh, articulately about the, the tiers, the scale of democracy in other countries next to ours, and it's pretty stark, you know, or talks about community councils which are just denuded of power because their budgets are meaningless. So they end up kind of petty parochial little bodies that nobody wants to be involved in. That's true. But I think what Bookchin brings to the party is the idea that actually if you are commodified, if our whole cities are commodified and our cells are commodified and our interpersonal relations are commodified, it's quite difficult to be political. We're not really citizens. So as I've repeatedly said, we're either British subjects or active Scottish citizens. right? And there is a connection here between this and independence. Um, but beyond being just subjects under the Queen, we're, we're mostly consumers. It's very difficult to be an active citizen if your main role in life is to buy stuff you don't need. And our entire system is based around selling us stuff we don't need and then charging us to recycle it. This is a nonsense, this is a farce, and this is an ecological catastrophe. So I would bring that alongside uh, Leslie's analysis of the of this, the, the stages we're at. Yeah, it actually leads off of what you just said. Uh, what you said we pretend it does to create a sense of community. What do you think? You talked about solidarity, and I think from what you were just saying, there's this idea that you can't just like download Putin's pamphlet and go around knocking on people's doors, setting up a trying to set up a neighbourhood assembly. Yeah. When there's no fertile ground for that. Like mm-hmm. People perhaps wouldn't feel comfortable. They wouldn't really understand what it is that you're trying to do or something. Mm-hmm. Some people might, but, but maybe not. So I guess my question is, what's the first step to get from where we are to this? Mm-hmm. Is, is it just throwing everything at the situation? 
Do you think that people will learn to be more democratic if you try and force them to participate in neighbourhood councils, or do you have to build the solidarity first through other means, and then bring in the idea of the neighbourhood council later, because then mm -hmm. it might actually work? Or mm -hmm. I mean, what, what's your perspective on how how we get from where we are to, 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 to how we actually? Okay. I just wonder in, in Kurdistan whether maybe there's a pre-existing sense of solidarity in that community because they're yeah. already a disparate diaspora across the current nation states. Yeah. Right? You still have a sense of coherent identity. Maybe that it was off of that that they were able to put these things in place. Yeah, I don't know enough about that situation, and, and maybe other people do that can speak to that. But um, I think that um, I suppose because all this does seem completely disconnected. But for me, it's it's about um, the phrase we had in Bella Caledonia, which is uh, autonomy, self-determination, independence. So a deepening sense of what self-determination actually means. And you could even um, you could even associate it with Brexit. You know this bizarre notion of taking back control. Uh, you know how how's that going for you? Uh, it's, it's really out of control. But at the same time, there is something that people are, are dragging on there, this feeling of being disconnected from an elite, feeling that bureaucracy and democracy is failing for them. Um, and even if that was propagandised and, and uh, you know, dark money uh, was involved, there's something going on there. And I think the only thing that I can say from the Syrian example is out of crisis, people respond. Systems fail. Systems basically completely collapse, you know? And I think we are seeing this in the West. We are seeing a complete systems failure. Either, you know, um, I was at an event run by the Scottish Government last month uh, talking about the New North, uh, and it was of the Arctic Council, and they invited Iceland and Sweden and Greenland and everybody to come around, what's, what's going on? And they said, this is all about climate change. And you sat there. And there were some great speakers, and then they were saying, you know, the real problem with the, the Arctic and the, the polar ice caps melting, you're like, no, no, no shit, sir, Sherlock. And then basically you had a series of speakers from sh kind of shipping firms saying, well, you know, that's bad, but great for shipping routes. And basically what Scotland needs to do is open up its ports because you, you're missing out on the action. So um, if you don't think that there's systems failure in terms of as you view the kind of Brexit shambles, this is supposed to be our government exercising uh, a process of national humiliation that is going to end up in economic, you know, catastrophe. That's one sign of system failure. You know, elite rule has failed. It's fine when they're good at it, they're shit at it. The ice caps melting, that's maybe a sign. So I think as these systems collapse, and I'd put alongside that food, our food system making us ill, childhood obesity, uh, a diabetes epidemic, um, you know, who in this room isn't allergic to some sort of food? Or who doesn't know somebody who's extremely allergic to some sort of food? These are signs, this is a metric of system failure. Doesn't really answer your question, how do we get from here to there? Like knocking on the door, here's post Kirsty anarchism from 1971. Clearly that's not going to happen. But the drive to actually take back control and have some democratic uh, control at a more local level is what's going to take us out of chaos. And I think that a critique of the independence movement at its fringes, at its worst, which says basically if we remove the Union Jack and put a, a St Andrew's flag up, all done, all good. That's a nonsense. We need to understand... Um, Independence, self-determination. What does self-determination mean? What does it mean for women? What does it mean for communities? What does it mean for gay people? What does it mean for the poorest in our communities? That, to me, is what independence is about. So I, I, that's how I see these things being connected. I was just worried, because I, I hear a lot of people say, there's this old thing where people say it's got to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. People aren't really going to understand or act until, you know, the, the sea sure. levels at the front door sure. kind of stuff, right? Due to climate change and so on. Mm -hmm. But I guess there's something a bit debilitating about that. Like you were talking about, which <laughs> was like, oh, right, so we've just got to foment ecological destruction for everyone mm -hmm. before we all are put in a crisis.
crisis mode, whereas a, a whole community would consider alternatives. Mm -hmm. I'm just hoping that's not. No, I, I I'm get. I'm hoping we don't have to. I, I understand because that that is a shit argument, you know, and it is that it was a classical <coughs> left argument, you know, when people get really poor, then they'll up right. Well, that's not what happens. People turn to fascism or get more and more extreme. But I think that um, seeing, visibly seeing systems failure alongside the palpable opportunity of some of the technologies that are emerging is, is, a, is a sea change, I think. Just a small comment, sorry. But you know, as you said, like seeing some changes, you know, like, okay, the, the system collapses and to have these changes to be implemented, I think conflict should be there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's like through the history, you need a conflict where you need to kind of like, you know, as I said, like, uh, moving from a chaos to an order, so mm -hmm. it's kind of like a difficult, you know, difficult. Like you said, like like physical uh, I don't know, but it's kind of like you need you need that conflict. Like a simple example, like uh, uh, Catalonia. Yeah. They did the referendum. They got the majority, and look what happened. Mm -hmm. They had to this, had this kind of a conflict yeah. where the people have to be exiled, the politicians, and now they're speaking mm -hmm. to kind of like implement the new changes. So yeah. conflict is always there, you know. But I know nobody wants it, but. It's kind of like part of the change. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, whilst I was deriding the notion of endless struggle, because struggle isn't a very attractive thing, come on, everybody, let's struggle. Oh, Christ. <laughs> let's watch Bake Off instead. But you're right, conflict is going to happen. This isn't going to be seamless because the powerful do not give up their power exactly. easily. And in Catalonia, it's been incredible the peacefulness of that demonstration against massive provocation. Well, and and yeah, and, and I think um, it's worth remembering that um, you've know, seen this uh, on a thousand street signs. Uh, this is um, uh, from Proudhon, the French anarchist, mm -hmm. and it means anarchy is order. So whilst we think of anarchy as being smashing in McDonald's windows, actually they argued that anarchy is order. So anarchy is a zebra crossing. A zebra crossing is anarchy. There are no rules, there's no policemen standing there, it's a line in the street and everybody knows. That is anarchy. So I think this notion of there will be conflict, but the ideas that are being put forward here are about how we have intrinsically in our beings a cooperative spirit, and it's about unleashing that rather than what we're encouraged to do, which is to hate each other and compete against each other and, and, and win and win and win. Can I, oh, okay, sorry, no, 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 no. You never uh, mentioned anything about class. Mm -hmm. Now, over the last three, four years, we've seen movements of the working class in Greece. Yeah. We saw in Scotland with the spontaneous movements uh, or working class people yeah. being, becoming involved in politics, as Alex Salmon stated, for the first time. Yeah. Um, we've seen it, uh, the, the March of Third Army in the United States, yeah. the working class movement again. We saw it in Catalonia. Yeah. We've seen it in various places, Venezuela, Bolivia. There's various places throughout the world the working class have actually stood up. Yeah. But in each and every place, We've been put back in their place. Yeah. Alex Salmon said in 2014, after the referendum finished, that the Scottish people would not go back into the political shadows. But we've been pushed back into the political shadows by the SNP. In Greece, we saw what happened with the, the, the socialist government here and how they were treated by Europe. Mm -hmm. We saw the, the, the betrayal, well, it's looking like a betrayal of the working class in Catalonia. Mm -hmm. Uh, we saw Venezuela, well, that was not so much a failure of the working class, but we've seen America step in, and we've seen uh, the chaos that's in Venezuela, mm -hmm. again pushing the working class down, I mean, the places are a complete mess. Mm -hmm. So everywhere we look, Bernie was defeated, everywhere we look, the working class have stood up, mm -hmm. but they've been pushed back down. Yeah. Now, this is a problem. Um, but movements will develop again, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, as you say, the system's failing. And this in itself, uh, as the gentleman over there says, brings about uh, divisions, brings about conflict, and these conflicts will continue. Yeah. But the problem is, every single time we stand up, we're pushed back down. Mm -hmm. We are pushed back down. Mm -hmm. We're defeated over and over and over and over again. And there comes a point when that energy has disappeared. Mm -hmm. 
we run out. Yeah. I mean, Tony's mentioned it to me several times that since uh, the referendum, there's been a difference in the, the consciousness of the Scottish working class and the Scottish lower middle class. You can always feel this despondency. I mean, I live up in Ardler, a working class community, and I saw an excitement uh, there in places like St Mary's and Cap and, and Driver and Charleston that I went into that I never ever seen before. Yeah. People were really, really excited about the prospect of a new Scotland. Yeah. That's what we went to the doors, the amount of times I heard someone say, I'm voting yes because I want to see a new Scotland, yeah. a different Scotland. Not this old one, not this one run by the elites, not this one run by the establishment that keeps us down and crushes our spirits and crushes our stuff and basically makes us this is just like we are not human. Yeah. You talk about commodities. I mean that's the whole thing, isn't it? Absolutely. And the whole the whole idea about us being viewed as being commodities is us being viewed as being non human. Mm -hmm. No wonder the treat us like the fucking day. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're not viewed as being human beings. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is, eventually, that spirit is destroyed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it in Scotland. You've mentioned it to me several times, Tony, that people's spirits have been crushed in the defeat uh, after the referendum. They uh have. -huh. I think what we saw in 2015, we gave the SP a chance. We, we voted them in with 56 or 59 MPs, the biggest number ever. Mm -hmm. 997, I think the Labour Party got 56, but that was out of 72. Mm -hmm. The first party ever to receive as much as 1.4 million votes. 2016, we, we were the first party in this, and we were the first party in Scottish Parliament and elections to receive over a million votes. Yeah. But what did they do with it? Yeah. And what we've seen is more and more people become disillusioned yeah. completely. So much so that in the last general election, some half a million working class people said, I'm going to vote in SP. Mm -hmm. 350,000 of them, I think, abstained altogether. Mm -hmm. They just said, No, I'm not voting. What's the point in voting for something that does not work for me? Yep. Now, this is a problem that's happening all over the, the Western capitalist world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What do we do about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's an easy one. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a member of any political party, right? I'm pro-independence, and I think that the most amazing thing about the independence referendum was the entire communities who didn't vote, weren't involved. And when I mean communities, I don't just mean working class local communities, but communities of people who were just disaffected, thought, this is going to be good, this is change. I can sense change. So why get involved in a political system that involves no change? But there was the sense that, that something different could happen. I think that was the exciting thing about that. And these other places I mentioned as well. Absolutely. 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 And and change and change can still happen. I don't agree with you that people are completely I think people are pretty scattered, but I don't think people are completely written it off. And I think as the British state um, collapses in its own ridiculousness, there'll be an opportunity again. Sure. I really think there will be. But it has to be from the bottom up, it has to be from grassroots, it has to be self-organised, self-determined, local groups, because that was where the energy came from in 2014. Right. So and that's what's going to change things. But you're absolutely right that social class and uh, the economic question is completely at the heart of this. And commodification is basically at the unit of, of workers treated and exploited. So I don't disagree with you. I do think it's got to change, but I think it's a challenge within the independence movement to keep to those questions and keep reminding people that that is the task. We're not about swapping flags. We're about transforming and reclaiming Scotland. <coughs> yeah. I, don't know just, I just feel I don't know much about politics. I haven't spent a lot of time reading. I just don't watch too many news headlines, but I... I've, and, and I argue quite a lot, have argued with my now ex-husband uh, being he, he, was, he was conservative and I was Lib Dem or Labour, really, you know. Um, but he would say that uh, the problem with Scotland is that they will not raise tax uh, rates even though they've got the power to do it already in Scottish Parliament because they can't bear the idea of, like teenagers, actually taking on adult responsibility and not being the goodies. And I think Alex Salmon put so many good things 
in place, like dropping the tolls from the bridges, a lot of very wise things that made SNP look extremely good. And that was extremely good credit in the bank, which he could have used to then, you know, they could have used to, to raise taxes and, and really show that they meant it, that we're going to, we're going to equalize. You know, it's crazy, the disparity, mm -hmm. disparity mm -hmm. between incomes is, is appalling and, mm -hmm. and should not be allowed to, to continue. And, you know, tax havens should not be allowed to continue. And it does no country in the world any good to see their brains and their uh, resources being drained into small islands all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, I, 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 I'm talking about money again, which, yeah. you know, you're trying I, to get away from no. life is capitalism, but um, people are valued, you know, by what their prospects and what their choices are, and, and if we want to allow people more choices, we got to get them some more money. Very quickly, I don't think that uh, the Scottish Government currently has the tax raising revenue powers that it needs to have. Uh -huh. I think it could do more with what it does have. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about tax and we don't have enough money and will we tax, we need to confront the reality that major corporations are not paying their tax to a massive scale as just been exposed. Mm -hmm. A massive scale that nobody knew before. So I would just refer your ex-husband to that reality. When we start talking about, oh, we won't make changes and stuff, tax the bloody companies. It's a corporate rip-off on an industrial scale that we was unimaginable before. What's just been revealed is unimaginable. It's theft. It's a kleptocracy. It's an obscenity. So deal with that, and then we'll come back and say, oh, should we change the rate of I just wanted to draw the comparison between Rojava Revolution and the anarchist revolution in Spain in 1936. What happened there was this, obviously the workers took power and then within a year they were crushed by the Salonists and by the Republican state. And I'm just, obviously what's going on in Rojava right now is great, but what does Bukhshin say about preventing state power taking over and vanguard parties and Leninism and things like that? Yeah, yeah. He's about the Spanish anarchists. Yeah, yeah. He wrote a book uh, called The Anarchist Collectives about Spain, and a lot of that he took inspiration from. Um, but, I mean, I suppose what, what his strength is, is that he's got a critique of the state and the power of the state and its ability to, um, to, uh, to absorb power. And I think that's maybe where, where it's, it's interesting in terms of a. Uh, a more traditional socialist uh, message. Um, uh, in terms of uh, vanguardism, he talks about the avant-garde and how there needs to be a, a cultural movement as well. And he specifically critiques Trotskyism and Leninism. And I can give you the references for that that are really good, uh, where he's specific on that. But I don't have that to hand, but he does it, address that issue. Yeah, he talks about um, this idea where you've got um, uh, two, two, a, a dual power situation where you might have a, uh, a democratic assembly and a, and a state-run authority within a city. And uh, he talks about that as a dual power situation. And then he talks about the moral authority of the democratic assemblies and how uh, they would have... Uh, sovereignty he talks about the key concepts of sovereignty and backing 
and how that would challenge the corrupt old system. Um, and he talks quite clearly actually about conflict and that being important to recognise that this isn't going to happen. Um, uh, they're not just going to go. I mean, you, you see in, in Catalonia exactly what's happened when the, the state is confronted, because that's what we're talking about. We're talk, talking about confronting state power. And what they do is they send in riot police to, 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 to batter people. That's what they do, because that's all they know. It's not very sophisticated. Um, so, um, but a lot of that is speculative. I mean, he draws on historical examples of how that has happened in different communities and in different societies, but, it, but we don't know. We don't know. We're, we're seeing in Rojava how that plays out, and, and it is unique circumstances. It's true. Yeah. Uh, there's another issue with conflict between the state and the state. Yeah. Splitting us up and pointing fingers and saying you're responsible for the cuts, uh, you know, and allowing, whilst we're divided, allowing the Tories to actually keep on passing the budget cuts. Revolution's a trap, you know that. Uh, and the way it's actually going is they're going to try and wipe out the limited gains that have actually been made through the revolution and gains have been made. Uh, you know, take up Mark in terms of his interpretation of what was said. I've always, you know, been around politics for a long time. So I've seen waves of military. Waves of popular and mass struggle. Mm -hmm. In 84, 85, I never thought I'd see anything like that again. Yeah. When I was in Liverpool, and the closest I've come to it was on the streets of Dundee during the referendum campaign, the same uh, mass character in that, yeah. that campaign. Now, the way that I think we should be, be, be going is uh, through a challenge of the Tories on the whole issue of social security. The Scottish Parliament cannot look after the most vulnerable within Scottish society, yeah. and, it has, and its purpose is. Yeah. What we've got to do is we've got to roll them back on the issue of universal.